what's going on? It's great to be here. How are you guys doing tonight? We're doing great. Just fine. Just fine. Uh, well, first, Axel, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join us here on the show tonight. Hey, bro, I'll tell you this, and I, I, let me get this out right up front. Anytime I can come out and um, do anything to, to help the wrestling business, help the wrestling fans, help the, the people that are involved, it's my pleasure. And on, on a Chuck Norris note, you know, Chuck Norris is impervious to having a heart attack because his heart doesn't have the balls to attack him. That's the one thing you need to know about Chuck Norris. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I did not Running know that. Joke. That is cool to know. That is very cool to know. Well, um, well, let's start up this interview. Like I interview all my uh, guests here for all, who's ever been in the professional wrestling business, such as yourself. How did you become interested in the professional wrestling world? I'll tell you what, man. It's like, uh, you know, it goes back for me, back to as, as long as I can remember. When I was, uh, I mean, I can literally remember watching wrestling with my grandfather when I was like four years old. And I, I you know, remember telling him, that's what I want to do, Pat. That's what I want to do one day, you know. And um, I'm talking about uh, what got me hooked was, um, you know, I, 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 I grew up in the mid-70s. And, you know, I got really um uh, uh, hooked on guys like uh, Superstar Billy Graham and Dusty Rhodes, who are my two favorites. And those two really are what made me want to be a wrestler, you know. And uh, and if you watch me, like, wrestle, I mean, I'm not talking about, like, the, the blood and gut stuff, but, you know, my regular, the wrestling stuff, you know, I emulate a lot of what Dusty Rhodes does in the ring, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, to me, he, he was, he... he above everyone was, you know, the reason that I wanted to be a wrestler. You know, he just, uh, he had that personified personification of, if you will, keeping it spoken like a monkey, being able to talk jack, put answers in the seat to make the people go crazy, baby. And that's what I liked about Dusty because, you know, he didn't look like some big bodybuilder. He looked like the guy that would hang out with you on the, you know, at the bar, sit there, drink a few beers with you, and then go in the back alley and help you kick somebody's ass. And then come back in and have a couple drinks. That, that's the kind of guy, back in my day when I was a little kid, that's what wrestlers looked like. They didn't look like these guys look like today. They look like, you know, a bunch of waxed up gay underwear models. I mean, that's not what wrestlers used to look like. They used to look like guys that could actually beat you up. So that's what got me into it, man, was, was guys like Dusty and Billy Graham. Um, you know, and, and, and later on, you know, when I discovered, you know, the NWA, you know, seeing guys, you know, that were just, just, just tough, rugged dudes, you know, like the Road Warriors and, you know, Ronnie Garvin and, you know, and Ric Flair, you know, it, 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 those, that was what I grew up on, and that's what really got me interested was, you know, but above and beyond them all, it was, you know, Dusty Rhodes was my, the reason I wanted to get into the business. All right, um, this next question is it's a three-parter. It's uh, how, when, and where did you break into the wrestling business? Um, well, how was kind of funny, man. Um, I'm, I live in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, I was uh, 16 years old, and I, I heard uh, a friend of mine um, who's now a radio DJ up here in town, uh, he refereed a little bit um, is, uh, for us here in Maryland on some of the independent shows. He and I had heard that um, there was this dude up at this boxing gym you know, when the boxers got finished at night, they were practicing wrestling. And we were like, well, we want to check this out. Because, I mean, you know, well, like I said, I was, uh, I think, 15 at the time, or 16. I, know, I must have been 16 because I could drive. Um, and uh, we, we went up there to this spot, like, beat up, dilapidated, like, warehouse in the middle of the hood. I mean, like, the, one of the worst neighborhoods in, 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 in the inner city. And um, sure enough, man, we, you know, we got up to, we up to the second floor, and you walk through the gym where all the weights and stuff were in the back. There was this ring, and there were these guys. They were wrestling. And I was like, "Oh man, this is it. This is it." You know, like you know, I've reached Nirvana, the Promised Land. But you know, it wasn't so easy. You know, because um, you know, here was this you know 16 year old kid. You know, you know, just saying, "Hey, you know, I want in. I want in. I want in." And they were like, "We don't know you. We don't know nothing about you." And you know, we're not. You know, we don't care what you want. And those guys were. Um, well, both of them, uh, unfortunately, have since passed away. Um, the, the the two guys that trained me was, uh, you probably know one more than the other. If you're uh, even a fan of, you know, mid-90s WCW, you know who um, Joey Maggs is, Jumping Joey Maggs. He was always on TV getting his ass whipped. Um, and, uh, the, and the other guy, his name was Jim Leon, who used to wrestle as uh, bad boy Ricky Lawless. This was way 
back in, you know, he passed away in 1988, so like, we literally passed away in my first year in the business. And uh, Joey, you know, died some years ago, like uh, four or five years ago. But um, those those were the guys that broke me in. And like for two weeks, I showed up every day, you know, and they just like, would basically ignore me and just tell me to watch, you know. And then finally they said, hey, get in the ring. And then like for the next week and a half or so, they just beat the living hell out of me, you know. And I said, okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And like, yeah, sure, kid. You know, I guess they were trying to see if I was going to keep coming back, and I did. You know, I got, I'd show up the next day, and I'd show up the next day. You know, and after about, you know, a week and a half of, you know, getting stretched and beat and, and you know, you know bruised up, you know, they're like, all right, get in the ring. And I'm like, oh, okay, here we go again. And then, you know, uh, GM and Joe are like, okay, this is how you take a bump. You know, I was like, what? You know, I'm like, you're not going to beat me up? You know, so for that's how I got broken, man. I got broken the way that, you know, traditional wrestlers that are, uh, like I said, guys that know how to work, which there are none left anymore. This new generation, there's no real workers left. They're just entertainers. That's how that's how wrestlers got broke into the business. You know, they don't do that anymore. I mean, um, it, it, there's no territories, nowhere for people to pay their dues. And my first match was like, um, you know, honestly, I, I don't recall. Um, you know, you, well, I guess some people might might have some monumental occurrence of their first match and you know but but again a lot of these guys like you know, some of these independent guys you talk to they say how long you been in the business they say oh I've been wrestling 20 years well yeah but you have like one match a month for 20 years I've had thousands of matches so I know where it was it was here in Maryland in a little tiny show in Port Deposit and I wrestled the guys that trained me but I couldn't tell you when it was I know it was like in um, like, like I think 88 so it's been quite a long time you know I'm, like I said, I've been in the business 23 years, and I'm not even 40 years old yet, so I'm like a grizzled veteran, you know, and I'm still like 10 years younger than most of these guys that are on top now, so that's the, that, that's about, you know, the full retro about me breaking into the business right there. All right, now, um, before your first match ever as a professional, can you describe for us the, the feelings and the thoughts that were going through your head the, the night before? you know, the time before your match and the time after your match? No, I mean, there's no way I can tell you what I was thinking. I mean, it's like, uh, as I said, I've had way too many matches to even, I mean, did you see any of the stuff I used to do? I mean, I got hit in the head with tables and trash cans and um, bat, baseball bats, so I don't recall too much of uh, something that happened 23 years ago. I just know, I remember after the match how happy I was that I actually got to wrestle, you know, because... You know, before that, it was always in the ring, in the gym, you know, with no one there. And, and the, the actual idea of going out and competing, and, and it was only in front of, like, 300 people. I remember I was super excited, and I was just happy as hell when we were done, you know, because I actually I, I got to go out and wrestle in front of people. So I remember the feeling after the match. I'm sure before the match, I was you know, bloody nervous, you know, because, you know, I, I'd never wrestled in front of people at all before. But um, I know afterwards, I do recall being really just super excited. I remember, you know, back then I had real, I had like long curly hair because I have naturally curly hair. And I, I just looked like kind of like a, a chubby, you know, really young, you know, like gorgeous Jimmy Garvin minus the beard because I had like this afro kind of like, you know, Brian Pillman had back when he broke in this curly big brown hair. And I looked really, you know, I mean, I was 16, you know, I looked like a, a chubby 16-year-old kid. I didn't look like a tough guy at all, but um, after the match, you know, I do just remember being real happy that, wow, I mean, I actually got to use these wrestling boots that I ordered and paid for to be a pro wrestler. So uh, it was pretty cool. All right, um, right. My next question for you, sir, is um, how did you find your way to Paul Heyman and ECW? Well, uh, there's a funny little story there. Um, uh, I'll skip around a little bit. I was wrestling here in Maryland, and then um, Joe Petticino started the uh, Global Wrestling Federation down in Texas, down in Dallas. Um, and I went down there and wrestled uh, when he first started that company up, you know, with, like, the Patriot Del Wilkes and uh, Exotic Adrian Street, you know, and, you know, Buff Bagwell was the hands of a stranger, you know, guys like that. Um, and what happened was one day um, uh, Jody Hamilton, who was one of the agents for WCW, happened to see me on TV. He didn't see me wrestle. He said the reason they, they called me was because he was sitting at his desk doing like some kind of paperwork, and he just heard this guy talk, and he looked up, and it was me. And he said, wow, that guy can cut a hell of an interview. We should see what we can do with him. 
because they had just fired the one-man gang, and they needed someone to wrestle PN News. And they, were, and, and they called me, and wouldn't you know that uh, it was me that got the job. It only lasted a month or two, but well, in that time, Paul, Paul Heyman was at WCW uh, with the, the Dangerous Alliance, you know, um, and that's how I happened to, to get to know Paul, you know, and, and he and I uh, got on pretty well, and, and, and we're, we're, we're pretty friendly with one another, so... Uh, we were able to, uh, you know, once ECW started, uh, um, actually Ian booked him on a show that he was running here in Maryland, and um, Paul said to us, he goes, hey, why don't you guys come up to this thing we're doing in Philly, you know, um, Eastern Championship Wrestling, you know, come on up, you guys would fit in, you know, and do the thing. So that's how that started, you know, it was, uh, well, it's funny when, when I watch, like, TNA and all these other things, and I hear these guys talk about being ECW originals, I was a guy that was there when it was still called Eastern Championship Wrestling. I'm an ECW original. A guy like, you know, you know, you know, Tony Mamaluke or, 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 or even, you know, I'm not taking anything away from these guys, though. I don't want you guys to think I'm saying anything bad. Like, you know, like even like a Rhino and, and people like that who were there like for a year or two before the company closed. You know, I was there from 1993 to, like, like 2000, you know. I mean, I was there when we used to have 50 people in the ECW arena, and we used to have to ask them all to move to one side so it looked like we had people in the building for TV. You know, um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, without question, an ECW original. I, I'm a guy who was in this company when it was still Eastern Championship Wrestling, you know, before it was even Extreme Championship Wrestling. So, you know, it's funny when I, I watch all these guys who are there, you know, toward the end when it was, like, dying and there was nothing going on. And, oh, I'm an ECW original on this. I'm like, dude, you know, really? If you weren't there between 93 and 98 when the heyday, you know, you have no right to call yourself that. You know, well, you weren't there when we were, you know, packing the buildings and bleeding all over the place and, and, and reinventing what wrestling was. And that's what we did for those years. We revolutionized the wrestling business. Uh, you mentioned his name, and uh, this question just has to come next. You know, when it comes to Ian, how was the bad breed formed, and uh, what was it like working with him, and what was it like uh, working all all this time with Ian and, and in the bad breed and being a tag team wrestler? Well, you know, um, it's like uh, funny that you mentioned it because uh, Ian and I, you know, legitimately, you know, for the last I guess two years, haven't spoke to one another. Uh, you know, there's people who think that like the whole. You know, Axel and Ian Rotten don't get along, you know, that's all work. No, we really work, the you know, last time we don't, we, we hate each other. But, um, you know, he just happened to call me about two days ago, and we, we started talking again. And um, so, you know, because I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't want to have heat with anybody. I don't want, I don't want, you know, that's not where I'm at in my life anymore, you know. So I'm glad we were able to work things out. Um, but, you know, he, I, I met him because I trained him. He showed up one day and he said, I want to do this. And I did the same thing to him that those guys did to me. And he kept showing up and kept showing up. And so, you know, I started teaching him, you know, and um, he uh, started wrestling, you know. And at the time, he was wrestling as Johnny uh, Lawler, you know, a, a ripoff of Jerry Lawler. Because when he was younger, he used to have that, like, goatee and all. He looked like a young Jerry Lawler, um, except fatter. Um, and uh, so... Uh, when then, and then uh, we put the bad breed together because I wanted to do a tag team. I needed a partner, and the guy that I was originally going to have my partner, he decided he was going to quit. So there was John, and I was like, fuck. I was like, you know, hey, forget it. You know, he can do it. You know, and that's how it came to, came about. You know, it was like, uh, you know, he was a guy I trained, so I know he knew he could do what he what, what he needed to do. And you know, we just put it together, and uh, you know, we 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 started teaming, and we we had a good time with it up until. Up until I got tired of it, you know, and it was me who decided I was done with it. I just said, I'm done. I don't feel like doing this anymore. And we, you know, we split up and did those series of matches that became, you know, famous. You know, obviously, because we're still talking about it now in 2010, you know, like the Taipei Death Match, the Barbed Wire Baseball Bat Match, those matches that people still talk about to this day. So, obviously, we did something that the fans, you know, really vibed on to. Uh, you, you mentioned... Uh the, the time pay death match. Um, well, uh, my news an analyst Rick Starr is standing by right here, and I know he has a, a couple of questions about that match, being as one of his favorite all-time matches. Rick Starr, you're on the line with Axel Rotten. Um, actually, um, well, th uh, thank you for uh, letting me ask you a couple of questions. Um, um, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, actually, that wasn't. Uh, I believe that was Ashley who I uh, wanted to ask the questions about uh, the uh, the tape by death, uh, death match. Um, 
I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I have never really watched ECW that much. Um, uh, I only got to watch ECW just towards the end, and unfortunately just when um, WWE had uh, soiled it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't really get an opportunity to see what we did then. <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah. But I, um, I do have two questions for you, if I may. Sure, um, no problem. My first question is, is um, what do you think of, uh, you know, you've been hit with every weapon in the world, just about. I mean, you've been hit with, you know, barbed wire, bats, barbed wire, chairs, uh, you know, hacks. You know, what do you think of uh, TNA's Janice? Uh, I think it's actually one of the stupidest gimmicks I've ever seen because you never really see it use it because you can't. You know, when you have like Rob Van Dam laid out in the pool of blood, I mean, you can't really swing people and hit people with it, so it's kind of stupid. I, I don't like it at all. If you're going to use a, you're gonna use a gimmick like that, you got to use something that's going to use, you know, and, and, and make it mean something. I think it's a dumb idea. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I agree. Yeah, I, I kind of agree because I think it's something that, you know, you can't use. You know, I think it kind of unfortunately makes it look silly. So, thank you. Yeah, if you're going to have a weapon that like that that looks that intimidating and looks that menacing and you, and you can't really use it, what good is it to have it? It just makes, it makes the business look even worse. Kind of like, you know, when Triple H has a sledgehammer and he never swings it at somebody's head. It doesn't make any sense, you know. If I had a sledgehammer, I'd swing it at your head. I wouldn't take any fun with it. Exactly my point. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's the point I've been making for several weeks on the show. That you know, if you're gonna, if you don't use it, then you know, it, it's kind of like a cheap date, you know, without the payoff. You know. Yeah, exactly. Um, but when, when we had the barbed wire baseball bat, we'd actually hit each other with it. You know. Exactly. Um, and my second question. Um, is this you know, Are you guys gonna be? Oh, there's some. Nah, the music I can really hear you, sir. Yeah, what is that music? Yeah, I don't know. Hold on, let me try and push this in there and stop. Rule, stop taking a lift. Hold on. I don't know why this music is playing. I don't know why this music is playing. AWO is taking over. What, is that you? No, it's not. It's like the bad, it's like the bad la lounge act or something. <laughs> yeah, hold on one second. Let's try this. Care of, 
Because I've watched the match over and over, and I don't see where anyone did anything too particularly wrong. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it, it seemed like it was what it was. It was fine. It was fun. Bottom line is the fans had fun, and that's all that matters. That's all I care about is um, I was in the ring, and I heard the people chanting, thank you, this is awesome, ECW, chanting Axel, chanting balls, thinking, chanting thank you. So that's all that matters to me is that the fans had fun. I don't care if anyone in, involved had anything to say. I could care less because at the end of the day, what matters to me is that the people that paid to get in or, or paid to, to, to watch it had a good time. That's all that matters to me. You know, I'm like, like I said, I'm not, not at the point in my life where I feel like I want to sit and talk about people, you know, and, and just say, you know, oh, it's, it's this guy's fault that I didn't get this. Or I didn't, you know, I'm not into that. You know, I'm not going to go there anymore. It's just, it's childish, you know. You know, the, the, the thing that TNA's doing, you know, um, I think Balls and I would have fit in and done a good job there. They didn't need us, and that's that. So no big deal. All right, okay, thank you. Fast forward to 2005. Vince McMahon and the WWE were doing their first, ECW Revival with ECW One Night Stand, and this has been since like five, four or five years since ECW folded after being on TNN. When you first heard word about Vince McMahon doing the first ECW Revival in 2005, uh, what was your reaction to it? Well, you know, I was, I was excited because it's still, it's still the same to this day. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how... When the wrestling business gets in the state of, you know, boredom and stagnation, they can't think of anything to do, they call on the band of misfit, outcast, out of shape, guys and freaks that like to bleed all over the place, that was never good for anything but wrestling in a bingo hall in Philadelphia. Those guys put us down every chance they got. But when the fans, you guys, the people out there spoke, what did they want? They wanted ECW. The fans to this day still want ECW. TNA proved it. That, you know, people were talking about it. And well, I'll go back to 2005. I'm jumping ahead. You know, the, the fans were nuts at the Hammerstein Ball Room. They had a great time. It was a, they, they loved it. You know what I mean? It was, it was an incredible time. People had a blast. Um, the people at Hardcore Justice, the fans had a blast. They had a great time. To this day, the people still love and respect what we did that much. That's why we're still talking about it. You know, I'll say to this day, I'll say people will come up to me and say, dude, that Taipei Deathmatch you did in 1995 is the sickest thing I've ever seen. Or, or, man, I saw a match with you and Ian versus the Pitbulls from Philadelphia. Man, a double dog collar match. That was crazy. You know, and I'll challenge them to go and say, okay, I want you to go back to 1995 and tell me what's your favorite, I don't know, uh, uh, Jeff Jarrett matches. They're going to go, oh, I don't know. I don't have a favorite Jeff Jarrett match from 1995. And I said, that's my point exactly. That's the, that's my point. But all those guys that used to bury ECW, and I'm not singling out Jeff Jarrett. I just use that as an example. Um, you know, whenever, they, whenever wrestling gets to the point where they can't figure out what to do next, all they got to do is call up, like, ECW, and we'll jump into the, uh, the proverbial um, telephone booth and come out the hardcore guys again and change and do what we got to do to to pick up the slack. You know, there were people talking to me about, you know, the last time around, how, like, you know, they had never even thought of buying a TNA pay-per-view, but they're going to buy this one. You know, so that's that's how big of an impact we have on, on our fans, you know, and I, and I love our fans, and I still do, so... You know, and in 2005, it showed, you know, when Balls and I hit the ring, the place went nuts, and we come out and hit the BWO with the chairs and the little spot with the Dudleys. You know, it was, that's all we needed to do, and the fans went nuts. It was a great time. And I do believe we are being joined by Cornbread. Cornbread, you're on the line with Axel Rotten. Hey, what's going on, Axel? Hey, man, how are you? I'm doing good. Hey, I'm a big fan of yours. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, I got, I got uh, a question to ask you. Sure, man. Go right ahead. Hey, man. What was your mentality going into that Taipei Death Match? That's that's honestly like one of my three favorite matches in like the he history of ECW. Like yeah, I, right. I actually watched it on DVD today. And cool. Like, well, hey, what, yeah. What's your mentality going into that kind of match? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for uh, you know saying that, man. That means a lot to me. And I, and, I, and I say this, and I say it again. It's not just lip service, I man. You guys, like when you tell me stuff like that, that so that that means a lot to me. It means that my that that the fans appreciate what I did. But to be honest with you, man, that match, though, know, um, we 
look, just let me say this for, for the point of reference so everyone knows. Um, there's all these guys who are called, you know, the, the innovator of violence, the hardcore icon, the extreme legend, this, that, and the other. Let me set the history straight. The first person to use thumbtacks in the ECW arena was Axel Rotten. The first person to use a barbed wire bat in the ECW arena was Axel Rotten. first person to use a barbed wire board in the ECW arena was Axel Rotten. You know, I did all that stuff before any of those guys. Um, and the, 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 the time pay death match, barbed wire baseball bat match, at that time, there were no blueprints. There was nothing to go back and look at a tape and say, this is how you do it. We invented that. You know, like, you know, uh, when Ian and I put that glass on our hands, you know, we're sitting there going, all right, now we got ourselves into this, what the hell are we going to do? You know, what can we do other than go out there and be grotesque, you know, and just try to do sick, obscene things to each other, you know, and, you know, in and, and later years, there's been guys who have done stupider stuff that just, you know, really don't make any sense. But if you do watch the Taipei Death Match, you will see, you know, we actually, you know, we beat each other up and we try to win the match. We go for covers. We treat it like a wrestling match. You know, that's what I wanted to make it. I wanted to make it, you know, a violent, brutal fight that was also um, two guys trying to win. Nowadays, you got these guys who go out there and just, like, throw themselves through broken glass and no one ever goes for a pin. I think it's stupid, you know, it's still, you know, to the point of, if it's real or fake, who cares, you know, you should, the, the guy should still be trying to win the match, but, you know, going into that type of death match, I just remember saying to Ian, I was like, bro, you know, I said, let's just go out there and just try to be sick, so that's all we can do is just be as sick as we can possibly be, and hopefully the people respond, and they did, you know what I mean, and, and, and in that year, I just want to bring up that point, in 1995, Pro Wrestling Illustrated voted the Axel versus Ian Rotten, the Pro Wrestling Illustrated feud of the year. Now, in ECW, mind you. ECW, a company at that time that only ran like Philadelphia and New York, you know. Uh, we beat out, you know, whether it was a work or not, it doesn't matter. We, we beat out guys like Hogan and Flair and uh, Razor Ramon, Shawn Michaels. They put us over. Those guys. That's how important ECW was becoming. But you know, like the the Taipei Death Match, the barbed wire bat matches. We had no blueprint. You know, we went out there and invented that and invented that format. You know, and and I have no problem with saying it's not ego. It's not a big head. It's saying we did it and and we did it better than anybody because we did it before anybody. And um, and people have tried to imitate it later. later. Uh, it's kind of like going to see, you know, I'll bring up a point, like if you go see Kiss, you know, you see Kiss with the makeup, it's totally different than seeing Kiss without the makeup, you know what I mean? It's like, if you see Axel, like Axe Balls and Axel Rathbone, hey, hey guys, oh, come on, you gotta be living. Guys, hold on, the music starts again. What the hell is going on? Well, the timing I can't believe this is happening again. What the hell? I, I, actually, I, I apologize about this. That's okay, man. It's actually pretty funny. This is definitely nice to be messing up on your show. Yeah. Alright, hold on. Let me bring this up here. I was worrying about you doing like the sound effects, not the music.
again. It feels like we're being hacked or something. And yeah. Those actual rock. I hope not. Again. I don't know why. Uh, but I'm, uh, I, I, I don't think that's an accident. Right, well, I, I, just sent, I just sent in a, uh, I sent in a, a, all right, now I'm getting sound effects when people are calling in now. I mean, what is up with that? Um, Axel, thank you for coming back here. Um, yeah. I sent in a live, a live chat, uh, live chat question here to, to Blog Talk Radio, because this is, um, th this has never happened before, and uh, yeah, like I said, input. dude, you never know when stuff in the, in the wrestling business, man, anything Think can happen. You know, just it's crazy. All right, well, um, well, um, let's get back to the question at hand while I'm while I'm talking with these people here during the chat. Um, they mentioned the Taipei Death Match. Now, when the WWE produced ECW Bloodsport, the most violent matches in ECW. And the Taipei Death Match was included on that DVD. What did that mean to you? Well, it was just, it was basically, um, for me, it was verification that, you know, we had done something that was um, historic. It was monumental. I mean, because the reality of it is, you know, it, it was probably the most violent match ever done in ECW. Not one of, it was probably the most. So um, it had to be on there. And, and, and it was cool. That, that was included, you know what I mean? I think it was cool for the fans because, um, like, uh, the, the, the guy earlier was saying, it, I, it was, I, I don't know if he's still on here or not, um, you know, he was one of his favorite matches. You know, it, it had to be represented because there's a lot of fans at that point that felt that way, like, wow, this is so crazy, you know, and it meant a lot to me that WWE, you know, you know Paul Heyman, who, you know, had uh, and producing it made sure it was on there, so it was a cool deal. All right, um, well, uh, another person here that uh, definitely wants to ask you some questions. Normally his name is WWE fan, but tonight he wants to be known as ECW fan. So ECW fan, you're on the line with Axel Rotten. What is your favorite match of all time for you? Um, you mean the favorite match that I've been in or the favorite match I've ever seen? Uh, any. Um, the favorite match I've ever been in um, is, oh man, let me see, there are so many, I've had thousands of matches. My favorite one, yeah, has, uh, only for historic purposes, again, is the Taipei Death Match because people talk about it so much. Um, but, uh, you know, there, I've had so many matches that were fun, like like I had a singles match with Chris Candido in the ECW Arena back in 1995, 97, excuse me, which was tremendous a match, and it was uh, just one of my favorites. I've had so many good matches with me and Balls against, the, you know, Tracy Slaughter and Little Guido. Uh, I just love that whole time, you know, in the mid-90s in ECW. It was, it was such a good time, you know, it really was. Those are my favorite matches. Okay, um, another person who definitely has some questions for you is uh, right here via the X5 party chat, and that's Mick37. Mick, you're on the line with Axel Rotten. And he's not here. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> he's hearing that mystery music. Yep. Hey, right. Billy, can I make a comment? One more comment? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Hey, uh, this one goes to Axel. Hey, Axel, man, don't, you know... I ignore all the naysayers that say ECW was just garbage wrestling and, you know, thumbtacks and stuff. If it wasn't for y'all guys, I mean, wrestling wouldn't be at where it's at. I mean, I wish ECW was still around because I, I loved it so much. Yeah, and, well, well, you know what? Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. And, and, and it's like wrestling, we revolutionized it, man. We made those guys step up their game. I mean, ECW, we came along and we kicked wrestling's ass because they were so lazy. And then the fans saw, like, wait a minute. Look at these guys in front of a thousand people killing each other. This is the best, you know, because it proved that if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to go out there and bleed and bust somebody up and, and really do it, it could be done. And Vince didn't want that to happen. Ted Turner didn't want that to happen. He didn't want, they didn't want to see guys like us going out there and showing the world that there's a different style of pro wrestling than just, you know, big muscle-bound guys tiptoeing around in tutus. You know, you know, we had guys going out there beating the hell out of each other. And that's what the fans wanted to see. You know, in the mid-90s, you know, the America was, you know, an angry, an angry country, man. You know, we were in the middle of, you know, 
golf wars and all this stuff. You know, we needed someone's ass to kick. So people love watching, you know, us beating each other up. So it means a lot to me that the fans appreciate that. All right, um, Axel, I wonder if you can uh, um, talk about and uh, give us your opinion on not only the direction TNA is going right now, but the direction that WWE is going right now, and also the fact that Linda McMahon won her primary and is running for Senate. Uh, well, I mean, hey, congratulations. I didn't even know that that's great for her. I mean, whatever her aspirations are, politically or otherwise, you know, I wish you nothing but the best. Um, as far as the direction of, of the wrestling business, uh, I think that WWE... Um, and TNA, basically the TV products are horrible. I, as, a, as a wrestling fan, which I still am because this is what I love, I can't watch it. I haven't, I haven't watched it. I don't watch it. Um, I, I talk weekly to uh, someone who works in WWE, and I tell her every week how bad I think it is, you know. Um, I, I just wish that someone would, would, would step up and, and, and do something and, and try to get, bring this thing back to, to making it, you know, more... Um, uh, exciting and entertaining for the fans because I just, you know, I watched like a little bit of Monday Night Raw the other day and it was literally putting me to sleep, man. These, this, this, whatever this Nexus angle is, it, it, it just, I, I can't get into it. And as far as TNA, I, I just, I mean, nothing personal against anybody. I like, you know, I like a lot of the guys there, but I just don't think that it comes across on TV as being very exciting. Okay, um, and I know we talked about this earlier on, on the phone, and I wonder if you can like reiterate your, your opinions about it. You know, you were talking about you know, Melina, Gail Kim, and the lack of talent in the diva competition, in the diva wrestlers in the WWE. I was wondering if you can reiterate your opinions and your feelings about that here on the show. Yeah, for sure. Well, we were talking about female wrestling, and I said, you know, uh, wrestling has changed in all aspects, but, but girl wrestling, you know, back in the 80s, and you know, it was, it was wrestling. I mean, you had people like Wendy Richter, Medusa. Um, I mean, girls would actually go out there, Sherry Martel, they'd beat each other up and they'd wrestle. Nowadays, you know, they're really pretty girls, but they're not very good wrestlers, you know. Um, and it's unfortunate that I think the best female wrestler out there in America, Mickey James, WWE fired, and I don't know why. And you know, Mickey happens to be a close friend of mine. And I don't know why you'd get rid of the best wrestler that you have on your roster. Um, as far as female wrestlers, other than Gail Kim, who's a, go a really good wrestler, the rest of those girls, I'm not saying they're not worth having around, and, and but I'm saying they're not wrestlers. They're not. They're 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 pretty young ladies that that look great, but as far as wrestling goes, it's atrocious. Oh. Uh, if I may interject for one second, um, there is a, a news bit that I've uh, been reading uh, that. Right now, WWE is uh, currently trying to negotiate a uh, six foot nine diva named Is Is the Amazon. What do you think about that? Yeah, we were talking about that, and that's crazy. I, I mean, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't, I haven't actually logged on the internet uh, and checked out anything about that. But that would be interesting to see because I think with the way the fans were like, "Oh my God, how they reacted to China? How the hell would they react to a seven foot, you know, female?" Um, wrestling, that that would be, I mean, incredibly, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see it. Um, I don't know what the, the girl looks like or, or anything like that, but uh, that would be something that is absolutely, you know, a freaky sideshow type thing. So, you know, I would definitely tune in to see what, it would, it would spark my interest at least once. Let yeah, I saw a few pictures of it. Rick, hold on, let me oh, ask sorry. you this. How would they react, not on, well, not just uh, seeing a seven-foot diva in the ring, but how would you react to seeing a seven-foot woman in your grocery store? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that I mean, would freak you out. That's the thing. I mean, if, if they in, in wrestling, it's even all, it's like a whole wow thing. But in real life, so to speak, it's a totally all wow thing. So I think the shock value is what they would go for, and the fact that you know it would be like, wow, man, this is freaky looking. So you know, whether or not they could actually legitimately keep it exciting, or she could actually wrestle, because I mean, you got to remember, those, most of those girls that they have wrestling aren't very good wrestlers, they're just very pretty girls. So if you put, you know, a very pretty girl in the ring with a seven-foot girl who doesn't know how to wrestle and she ends up getting, like, her face busted, you know, that, that, that very pretty girl's not going to be very happy. You know, so, you know, it's, it's a very dangerous situation. Yeah. Uh, I actually checked ahead, the pictures of... Oh, sorry. Um, I did check out a few pictures of the show. They're still actually not bad looking. She's blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, she's not, like, fat. She's kind of thin. 
for her size, um, and she can move around. Um, Good. Well, so, that's you know, cool. The only thing I'm, yes, the only thing I'm worried about is that she might get what I call what I call the China effect. So back in the you know when Ch China was in the WWE, you know they might just you know stick her on the outside. Yeah, or, or I have a wrestle the big show. Because <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, I really think if she's legitimate, like six foot nine, I think the battle of the sexes, you know, the big show versus the big girl. I mean, I think that would be pretty incredibly funny to see, you know. Um, and it might actually spark interest among the female fans too, having someone they can rally behind who's actually a giant because it's never happened before. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm Billy. the person who's yet to um, ask you a question. His, he's here on the line. His name is Andy. Andy, are you there? Yes, can you hear me, Billy? Yes, we can hear you. You're on the line with Axel Rotten. Hi, Axel. How are you? Hey, nice, nice to talk to you, Andy. I'm doing great. What's going on, man? Yeah, Andy from the UK. Everything's going fine, thank you. Well, I just want to say right. thing, really. Uh, I appreciate everything you've done for the business. Um, since uh, you guys have left the ECW, well, ECW's not there no more, it... Um, I think us wrestling fans are looking for something similar, and hopefully TNA will produce it for us. What I want to do is, if possible, take you back to 1996 with the infamous mass transit incident. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Do you personally think that New Jack went too far? Well, uh, Andy, I, let, me, let me tell you this. I mean, the, I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but the only reason that kid was in the ring was because I wasn't there. Yeah. You know, that... I was, you know, because I didn't know if you were aware of that. Yeah, I was supposed to Devon. Yeah, Devon and I were tagging up, and um, I, I uh, couldn't get a flight out of Baltimore, and we couldn't arrange my travel, and I couldn't make it to the show in Revere. And, you know, this kid got in there and, you know, uh, God forbid, got the hell beat out of him. Do I think New Jack went too far? Look, man, I, I'll say this, and I, I'll, I'll always say this. People can say what they want about New Jack. New Jack and I have always gotten along. He's always been a friend of mine. I have never had one problem wrestling with New Jack, um, me personally. And I, but I've seen New Jack beat people up, and I've seen people try to beat New Jack up. Um, so all I can say is, you know, whatever Jack did during that thing, you know, he, something must have happened to piss him off to the point where it happened. It went down that way. Um, to be quite honest with you, I've never really sit and watched the whole thing. I, I, uh, but it's you know it was it was gory it was messy. Um, I think you know Jack did what Jack does, and maybe it was too much. But you know who am I to say? I mean I don't I wasn't in the ring. I don't know. And us sitting here watching it and speculating as to why he went off the way he did, I don't know. You know, and that guy, that kid Eric, shouldn't have been in the ring anyway. He was like, uh, you know, he wasn't he was nowhere near ready to be in the ring with guys like that. Yeah, I mean I, I've, I've got it. Sorry, Go ahead. sorry, Billy. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, like I said, I've, I managed to get a fan cam copy of the um, the video and watched it quite a number of times, and it did seem to be a little bit near the knuckle. It was a bit too bloodthirsty. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. TV. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think from what I can recall, um, uh, speaking of, I think Jack just got really pissed off that the kid kept messing up and didn't know what he was doing, and Jack just snapped. I mean, that's all I can think of, because, like I said, I've wrestled New Jack hundreds of times, and I've never had one problem with him. You know, he's one of my, uh, you know, I, I consider a friend in, in and out of the business, and I, I've always considered him, uh, you know, one of the easier guys I've ever had to get in the ring with, ever. You know, I've never had a problem with him. But, so there's been people that have. All I can say is I haven't, and I, I welcome wrestling him any time, you know. Because I've done it hundreds of times, maybe thousands, and, and I've always had a great time with him. Uh, and just one final question. Who's your toughest sure. opponent that you think you've ever fought in your career? Who's the toughest opponent you think you've ever come across? Um, as far as just, um, now this goes back when I was very young. Um, I, it was like 1993. And I was I got a chance to work for WCW. I actually wrestled Vader one time in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and um, he just hit me so freaking hard. You know, I'd never been hit that hard in my life. You know, and if you guys have ever seen Vader, you know he's he's not what he used to be now. He's big and fat, but back then he was just a big, thick, barrel-chested, tough guy. You know, and when he hit me, man, you know. I felt like I was getting hit by like a 20-pound cinder block. So without question, I mean, the, the toughest guy I've ever been in the ring with, I would say, is Vader. You know, I mean, the guy was, when I wrestled him, he was just a monster, you know, because this was like in 93, like I said, when he was just, 
starting with WCW and just coming over from Japan where he was so used to working so stiff, I mean, he just beat the living hell out of me. You know what I mean? I was like the, the toughest six minutes of my life. One more uh, question hey, before you go. Cornbread. <clears throat> right, hold on. Let Andy ask his question, Cornbread. Yeah. Oh, um, if, if, you were in, if you were actually chosen to stay in the WWE, for example, would you prefer to be in wrestling for the money aspect, which we all go to work to earn money, or you, are you in the sport for the love of the sport? In other words, would you like to make thousands or millions of pounds doing the, the thing that you love most, or would you just prefer to wrestle uh, on indie shows and, and break a living, make a living like the average you know, man? Well, the funny thing is, Andy, here's the thing. It's like, if, if, if you can make a living doing what you love, I, I think that everyone should be able to do that. I mean, as, as human beings, I think we have the right to be happy. Uh, and, if, if re and wrestling, believe me, I've been doing it since I was 16. makes me happy. If I could go out there and get paid to do it and make a living at it, I would love it. If WWE wanted to hire me and let me work behind the scenes, I would love that. Uh, but I'm just as happy in a high school gym in front of 300 people as I am in... You know, the Continental Airlines Arena in front of 18,000 people. I just love wrestling, you know, and it's, it's, it's been in my blood, and, and, it's, and I, I love it. And I would love, Andy, to be honest, I'd love to make a living, you know, doing it. But if I have to stay on the independent scene and, and, and just barely get by and, and wrestle and, and have fun, that's okay with me. I've, I've had a lot of fun in my career, and I'm having a lot of fun right now. Okay, Fantastic um, answer. That's why for... you are as popular as you are. That's all I can yeah, hey man, I'm as popular as I am because of guys like you and everyone else out there that supports me, and that's what means a lot to me. And, you know, and again, Andy, thank you for the call, man. And you know, cheers to all my fans in the UK. You know, Axel loves you guys over there too. So you know, hit me up on Facebook. You know, look up, look me up on MySpace. You know, all the people over across the pond, holler at me, man. Let me know. You know, talk to the promoters over there. Tell me you want Axel Ryan to come over. I'd love to come over, man. It's been a long time since I've been over there. No problem. Will do. Take care. All right, Andy. Thanks, buddy. All right, um, Axel, I want to take you to 2006. All right. WWE is uh, bringing their ECW brand, introducing their ECW brand to the WWE universe. My two questions for you is, one, what was your whole opinion about WWE's version of ECW? And before they were introducing the ECW brand, you were listed on the website as one of the roster members of ECW, and then later during the week you were taken off. I was wondering if you could tell us what exactly happened. Yeah, well, I was one of the first guys. I was, I was one of the first guys. I was one of the first five guys signed. Um, it was like me, Sabu, Sandman, Balls, uh, like Little Guido. Or, 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 hey, at any rate, I was one of the first five guys signed. I mean, I was, I was getting paid for like a month and a half before they were getting ready to relaunch the brand. And... Um, you know, just some personal issues went down where I didn't go. And I was like, you know, I don't, I, I regret not showing up, but I, I don't regret it because I see how it turned out. I mean, it was, it was terrible. I mean, it was like, Vince, Vince just t decided because I think the fans loved ECW so much, all he wanted to do was t make sure he could erase any memory of what we did and make it his own. And, and, you know, just destroy, you know, he wanted people, when they thought of ECW, not to think of, like, like Axel Rotten, Balls Mahoney, Sandman. He wanted them to think of, like, I don't know, Shelton Benjamin, Dolph Ziggler, you know. You know, he just wanted to try to ruin, you know, what we brought in because he, he just couldn't stand that there was something more popular in wrestling than his product. Okay, um, well, uh, again, I'd like to thank you, Axel, for coming on the show. Um, do you have any upcoming dates, any upcoming shows that you're doing either in your area or wherever you're going that, that you're fixing to do? Do you, um, do you have any upcoming dates that you'd like to Yeah, man, I'm, I'm always, I'm keeping busy out there. Um, you know, the best way to just find me is just to, to, you know, go on the internet and go, you know, go to the Facebook and just uh, type in my, you know, um, my real name, which is Brian Knighton, K-N-I-G-H-T-O-N, and it'll say Axel Rotten, ECW on there. That'll keep you up to date on where I'm at, what I'm doing. Or go to myspace.com slash Axel Rotten. That'll keep you up to date. I mean, I got stuff coming up. I'm heading to Detroit. I got stuff in New Jersey, uh, some dates in Pennsylvania, a few things in the Carolinas. So I'm all over the place. But, you know, nothing specifically I really want to plug. I got a, an autograph signing I'm doing up in New Jersey on September 11th. 
um, um, wrestling. I think it's in Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania on September 11th. I'm doing a double shot that day. Uh, I stay busy, uh, and, and I want to say, you know, to you guys, thanks for having me on. Any chance I get to, 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 to talk to the fans, I appreciate it, um, because without you guys, without the fans, without you guys in the wrestling media, there would be no Axel Rock and there would be no, you know, anything. So it means the world to me that people still want to talk to me and they care about what I'm doing. And, you know, it, it, it's still to this day, you know, when I walk through the curtain and I hear people chant, Axel, Axel, man, it, it gives me goosebumps. And, and, you know, I really, I want the fans to know that I'm, just a bigger fan of them as the day of me. It means the world to me that after all these years, people still care to get a picture taken with me, get my autograph. So, you know, I, I want to just want to say thank you to the, to the wrestling fans in general for just, you know, actually caring about what I'm still doing. So it means a lot to me. And well, hey, Billy, can I make one last comment to Axel? W one, one quick last one, man. Hey, uh, Axel, in lieu of... You know, being able to talk to you tonight, I just ordered my first Axel Rotten T-shirt off the internet. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much, man. To wear it proudly. I hope so. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, hey, I mean a lot to me, man. That's another thing. When people go to me and, you know, they want to know, hey, they want any one of those actual F and Rotten T-shirts. That's cool. Or will you sign this old action figure? I love that, man. I mean, you know. It, it, without you guys, I wouldn't be here, and I'm going to be here as long as you guys want me to. So, um, you know, wear that shirt with pride, man. You know what I mean? Take a picture of yourself with it and send it, email it to me. I'd love to see it. Oh, hell yeah, and I'll, I'll always chant ECW, man, for you, man. Thanks, brother. It means a lot to me. I appreciate it, man. Axel, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. You guys have a great night. Yeah, thanks, guys. Hey, hey thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.